Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, we are going to be all over the place today. So if I was going to tell you a verse, forget about it. We're going to be literally all over the place today. We've been talking about what it means to experience this life that Jesus has (coughs) called us to live and some of the reasons that we've not experienced that life. So last week we talked about how do we initiate lasting change. So we're going to look at that again today. And what we looked at last week was this idea that our habits and anxieties and things, these things kind of hold us back sometimes, the influence of the world, these competing commitments. If you remember, we looked at this guy last week that came to Jesus and he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, you know, keep all the commandments. He goes, I've done all that. And he says, well, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And it says the guy went away sad. And what Jesus had exposed in this guy's life is that that's what was holding him back was his comfort in his material possessions. And we can fall into that trap, right? These competing commitments. And we looked at these things that are kind (coughs) of catalysts to change. And one of those is there's work that God does in us. As a Christian, God puts his Holy Spirit in us. and, And the Holy Spirit begins to guide and lead us. And that's part of what initiates change in us. And we said, okay, well, if if God does his part, why am I not at this place where I feel like I've changed like as much as I should. And, and the truth of the matter is there's, there's a part of it that's on us as well. And we went and looked at verses like Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We talked about this idea of being crucified. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, I, I, I offer my body as a living sacrifice. We, we, we looked at that. Like that's our part is this idea to surrender. And, and that's the part that we struggle with. That's why this guy struggled with with his wealth is that was one of those things he wasn't willing to die to. He wasn't willing to live open-handedly with those things that he had. So what I want to look at today is maybe the most important piece for us as Christians on what initiates lasting change. It is the most powerful force in the world. You know what it is? Love. It's the most powerful force in the world. It will make you do things you've never done before. It will make a middle schooler shower. (laughs) If you have a middle schooler and they come home one day and all of a sudden they're putting on deodorant and taking showers, there's a potential for love in the air, okay? It will make you do weird things. Like I was living life, you know, I was in college living life, doing uh, whatever I wanted to do, and then I met Shelly at a funeral, like, which is odd, right? So if you're single and you're, you're on the lookout, hey, just go down to clicks at your random funerals and maybe <laughs> put yourself out there. It works. Like I met Shelly at a funeral and like, uh, <coughs> I, like the, the, I used to hang out with the guys and we'd play volleyball all the time. Well, that began to change, right? It, it, it changes the way we live our life. You think about when you became a parent for the first time. You know, I I talk about how when I drive, I'm an offensive driver. They talk about how you should be a defensive driver. That's not me. I drive on offense. I think the best defense is a good offense. We're going to outscore everybody. We'll just get there before they get there. Well, when you have that first child and you put them in that car seat and you're on your way home, I drove the speed limit. And, And, like, if anybody got close to cutting me off, I was ready to, it's time to go. Like, I'm carrying precious cargo here, right? It, it changes us. As a parent, when you have a child, it changes you. It changes the way you look at life and the things that you do and all of a sudden the commitments that you make. And that's what love does. It's a powerful force. <laughs> Think about uh, in the Old Testament, Jacob. Jacob met this girl named Leah that he fell in love with. He worked seven years to have her as his wife. His father-in-law tricked him. So he had to work another seven years, 14 years. That's what love will do. It will cause us to do strange things. So, so what I want to look at today is this idea of what bi- the biblical definition of love is because it's different than the way the world defines love. The world defines love as this feeling that you get, like this 
you know, it makes you shiver in your spine or whatever. Whatever it is that, you, that we imagine that love is, it's this emotion. But that's really not what love is in the form of what biblical love is. One of the passages that I use all the time at weddings is 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, all those things. And then you get to the end and then it really tells us what love is and it says love never ends. This is why the world's view of love is incorrect compared to the biblical view of love because the biblical view of love says it never ends. The world says love can come and go. But the Bible doesn't teach that about love because what, what it says about love is different. And I want to look at some verses here. For the sake of time, I'm going to try to paraphrase much of these. But in, in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus says to love your enemies. Now, in the worldly view of love, is that possible? It's not, is it? So what, what Jesus is telling us with a verse like that is that love is actually a choice. It, it's, it's a commitment. It's a, a choice of the will. Like that we can make ourselves do that. And, and, and there's other kind of things that we look at. We think about that passage in Mark chapter 10 where Jesus was talking to that guy, the rich young ruler, and he said, come and follow me. And what he exposed in that guy is that he loved his money more than he loved God. He was more committed to that than he was to God. He had already made a choice. Luke chapter 16 verse 13, Jesus said this. He says, no servant can serve two masters since either he will hate the one and love the other. Or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And here's what Jesus is showing us. Go back to this guy in Luke chapter 10 that had the two things. Like he wanted, to, he wanted eternal life, so he, he wanted a relationship with God. But he had this money that he wasn't really willing to part with. He had two masters, if you will. And, and Jesus says, well, at some point you're going to have to choose. You can't have two. It's about a choice. You can't serve them both, so you have to make a choice, and that's what love is. John 3, 19, it talks about how that the people loved darkness. You, you know what that means? It means that they chose darkness over light. They would rather stay in the dark and keep their sins hidden than to go to Jesus and be cleansed of their sin. That's Jesus is the light. So they chose darkness. I, I, I'm going to stay over here in the dark. You guys are the bad side today. Mark chapter 12. He says, he's talking about these two commandments. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that kind of a natural love that the world would consider? Because think about what he's really saying. When, you, when you've got to love your neighbor as yourself, that means whatever that you would do for you, you would do for your neighbor. Now we may say, well, I love my neighbor, but would I do anything for him that I would do for me? Like that's really what he's talking about. That's, that's not the way the world thinks of love. It's a choice. I would submit to you that without a choice, without it being a choice, it's not love at all. That that's really what love is. I, I've said this before and I've used this example before that if you're married... There's 8 billion people in the world. So let's just assume half are male and half are female. There's only two, by the way. Just male and female. Let's get that out of the way. But let's say they're half. Four, four billion women, four billion men. If you're married, what you're saying is, is that I chose my spouse over everyone else. And you can say, well, well, I haven't met everybody else. Well, it doesn't matter, right? If you're married, no matter who else comes into the picture... I've chose you. That's it. Like you don't have to worry about it. I've chosen you. I'm committed to you. That's what love is. That without a choice, it's actually not love. You think about this. Like it, Shelly and I are married. I think she loves me. I don't know. But let's say I loved her and she didn't love me. And I forced her. That, like you go to jail for that. It's called kidnapping. Right? So it has to be a choice. This is why God gives people free will. He gives us the free will to actually choose to love Him. And you know what that causes? It causes some people to choose 
not to love him. It causes some people to choose to do evil and to do evil against other people. But at the end of the day, what gives God glory is that people choose to love him. What if he forced us to love him? Would that give him glory? No, not at all. So that's why love is a choice. He gives us this choice. That's what it's about. The other thing about love is, is that what it causes is, is you think about those passages like love your enemies or love your neighbor as yourself. We looked at a passage in Ephesians 5 this morning downstairs in the men's study that said that husbands are to love their wives as they love themselves. What does that mean? Well, that means that anything I would do for me, I would do for my wife. Like if, if she wants me to get up and do something, I get up and go do it. Whether I really want to do it for myself or not. Because she would do the same for me. She does things for me. And, and that's the idea. It's, it's a, there's actions that come out of this love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. See, God doesn't just tell us he loves us. He shows us. And see, the Bible talks a lot about love, not just God's love for us, which it certainly does, and we've spent a lot of time on that, but it also talks about how we should love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Places like that, right? So, so we're called to love God, and, and He loved us with, with action. He loved us. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, I'm going to read verse 8 for the sake of time. It says, God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Another translation says, he demonstrated his love. He didn't just say he loved us. It, he proved it. It changed his actions. It impacted the way he did things. It was more than just speak. And so we're all faced with these choices. I want you to think about Peter. Peter was a fisherman. He was called to follow Jesus, and he did. He, he kind of left his fishing business, and he, he, he went and he followed Jesus for three years. And <coughs> Jesus is telling him, hey, I'm about to die. They're going to come, and they're going to arrest me, and I'm going to die. And, and Peter said, Jesus, I would die for you. I'll kill for you. And he actually would. He actually sort of proved it because when the guard showed up, he cut a guy's ear off. So he was willing to go to war. Well, then Jesus kind of backed him off and he put the guy's ear back on, which is yeah, it's wild to just think about that. Like, here, put that, put that back on. He, he put it on and then Jesus is like, okay, let it be. This is part of God's will. And Jesus gets arrested and then he's, he's, he's being tried and, and things are not going well for him. And, and they begin to question Peter. Hey, aren't, aren't you one of those guys who was following him? And he's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Three times he denied Jesus, even to a young girl. And then Jesus rises from the dead, and uh, he, he has this encounter with the disciples, and then he, he meets Peter on the beach. And I want you to see this, because Peter had made this choice earlier to deny Jesus. And, and, and Jesus wants to circle back. John chapter 21, verse 15, look at this. It says, When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, right? Prove it to me. Show me. Like, you, you, it's going to impact your life moving forward, Peter. If you, if you decide you're all in, like it's going to impact your life. I need you to feed my lambs. Verse 16. The second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep. Really kind of the same thing as he says to him. It's going gonna, it's gonna to impact your life moving forward. 17. He asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time. You know why he, asked, he was grieved the third time? Because he knew. He knew that Jesus knew that he let him down. So Jesus is consciously asking him three times to say, Hey, I, like I know that it didn't go well just a few days ago. But, but do you really love me? That's what he wants to know. 
And, and he says, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. And you know that I love you. Now think about that statement for just a moment. He says, you know everything because he knows that he knows that he denied him. I don't know if that's good English. But he knows that Peter denied him. He actually predicted it and then he knows that it actually happened. And, and, and so Peter knows that Jesus knows everything. He knows that he is who he said he is. He knows that he's God in the flesh. And you know what he followed that up with? But Jesus, you also know that I, I really do love you. Like, like I, might have, I might have failed you those three times. But like you know that I love you. And look at what he says. He says, feed my sheep. Jesus said, truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted to go. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will tie you and carry you to where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he told him, follow me. So here's what Jesus was telling Peter. He wanted to know if he loved him. He actually already did know. But he wanted to, he wanted to hear it from Peter because he wanted Peter to verbalize it. And then he was going to tell Peter, hey, you know that loving me is going to cost you something, right? That when you actually follow me, it's going to cost you something. And, and we're really going to find out whether you love me or not. Now, Jesus knew the answer. He says, when you were young, you got to do whatever you wanted to do. You could go wherever you wanted to go. But there's going to come a time when people are going to tie you up and they're actually going to kill you for following me. So you know what Peter did? He followed him. Why? Because he really did love him. That's what motivated him to do it. It wasn't out of some sort of obligation like he felt like, well, I owe it to him. No, he loved him. Like, like if you're... If, if you had to lay down your life for your child as a parent, you would say, I'll do it. Or your spouse, you would say, I'll do it. Why? Because of love. But, but, but what if it was just out of obligation, like you didn't really love them? Would you do it for that? Probably not. See, that's why love is the greatest force in the world. And that's why Jesus and, and, and God in the Bible kept talking about this idea of loving him. Like that's what will motivate us. That's what will challenge us. That will, that'll be what ultimately changes us. John chapter 15 says, This is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. He says what, what love really is is that it's sacrificial. It will cost you something. It will... And it compels us to do stuff. It compels us to change. When you fell in love with your, your spouse, it changed the way you lived your life. All of a sudden, maybe you're not running around doing the things you were doing before. Maybe you decide, hey, it's time to start taking a shower. That would be a good one. Right? It's time to get finances in order. I'm going to get married. I'm going to start, hey, you're going to eat that? No, I'm not going to eat that. I, you know, it changes your diet. It changes your finances. It changes all these things when you fall in love. And this is what Jesus is talking about here. <clears throat> so I want to look at one last passage here in Luke chapter 7. And, uh, and in this passage, there's a dichotomy. I know people like that word. There's a dichotomy. There's two things that are in opposition to each other here in this passage. And I want you to see it. And then I want to ask us, in this passage, who are we? Okay, Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says, then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And a woman in the town who was a sinner, don't, don't miss that, found out that, she, that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. So here's, here's the picture. The religious elite. You guys are going to be good in the second half of the sermon. Religious elite. Follower of the law. Respected. Put together. No, ex, no visible signs of sin in their life because they wanted to follow the law as best they could. And you got a woman with a bad reputation that everybody knew it, right? So that's, that's the two people who are around Jesus. And it says, uh, 
She found that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who forgave him, who he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who were at the table with him began saying, began to say among themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So as you look at this passage, you have to ask the question, Which one am I? Well, do you love God a lot? Or do you love him a little? Have you been forgiven a lot? Or have you been forgiven a little? The truth of the matter is, we've all been forgiven a lot. This Pharisee needed to be forgiven for self-righteousness. He was self-righteous, thought he was good enough to not even need a Savior. His sins are just as wicked as hers, if not more. But he was unappreciative where she was. And I think about this idea of life for us. Why we haven't experienced the life that God has called us to live. And I feel like maybe we're the Pharisee in this story. I mean, we're from the Bible Belt. We grew up in church, maybe. You know, we never were, you know, a, a sinner, as you would say. So, so maybe we feel like, we're the Pharisee, that we've been forgiven a little, but that's not the truth of the matter of what's happened. Maybe we've taken for granted the forgiveness that God has offered us. So where are we in this story? It reminds me of, of Romans chapter 7. Paul says, man, what a wretched man I am. But now keep in mind, Paul was a Pharisee. He was, he was like these guys. And he had come to the conclusion after having a relationship with Jesus, he said, I'm a wretched man. And listen, no matter how self-righteous we think we are, we're all wretched, just like uh, Paul talks about. And you know what it says later in, in, in Romans chapter 7? He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? But thanks be to God for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul had an appreciation for the grace that was offered to him. And he loved Jesus as a result of it. So where are we in the story? I'm going to ask TC to, and the band to come up. And here's what I want us to think about. The honest truth of the matter is, is that we probably, when we became a Christian, we probably felt like the woman. And we were thankful for what God had done to, to us and and the grace that he had offered us. But as we've gotten farther away from that moment, maybe we've begun to think of ourselves better than we really are. And maybe over time we've forgotten what it was like when we became a Christian and we've drifted into this place, maybe like this Pharisee, where we've taken God's grace for granted. Could that be us? It could be. I couldn't help but think of one last passage. It's in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus is talking to the churches. 
And he says to this one church, he says, I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name. And you have not grown weary, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. He says, listen, you're doing all these things and you're working hard. But you've abandoned your first love. You've forgotten what it was like. So what did he say to him? He says, remember how far you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. What was the works they, they did at first? They loved God. They loved Him. Think about that moment when you gave your life to Jesus and how much you loved Him in that moment. Let's go back to that. And that's when true change happens. Remember when you became a Christian, it probably changed you. And you're like, I, my life is going to be different. Why? Because love And the reason we're struggling now is we've lost that first love. Not that we don't love God anymore. It's just not in the same place that it used to be. So that's our challenge today. Would you pray with me? Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.